Okay. So thank you everyone uh, for joining uh, Science Cafe on today, October the 6th. This evening, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Jamie Jackart. He's one of the staff members at the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. Uh, he's going to be speaking to us tonight about carbon neutrality, how to achieve a net zero carbon footprint by 2013. Uh, Jamie's been at UMass Dartmouth for uh, nearly 20 years. And uh, for the last nine years, he served as the assistant director for campus sustainability. And his, his role in that position has been to, uh, to engage with the students, uh, the faculty and staff at the university on how, how we can improve sustainability at UMass Dartmouth and move us towards the idea, the goal of a net zero carbon footprint in the very near future. And this is desperately needed, I think, um, as, we, as we move forward in this, this new age. So before we begin this evening, a, a couple of things. You're seeing uh, Jamie's uh, screen. For some of you, uh, if you want, you can click the view options at the very top of your uh, Zoom screen and select the fit to window. For some reason, Zoom defaults to original size, which can cut it off for some viewers. So if that's not working for you, use the view options and fit to screen. That would be brilliant. Uh, this evening, uh, once again, in our virtual Science Cafe meetings, we're being hosted by the New Bedford Dwelling Museum and our great thanks go out to, in particular, Jocelyn at New Bedford Dwelling Museum, but the Dwelling Museum and all for assisting us in, in allowing us to have these virtual Science Cafe meetings. Normally, uh, we'd be at a local pub and we'd be drinking a beer and, well, I'm drinking a beer this evening because we're at Science Cafe. Jamie has a beer and uh, Nicole is drinking water for some reason unknown to most of the civilized world, but that is the way it is this evening. So uh, thank you, Jamie, for joining us this evening. Uh, I hope we're gonna have a really interesting talk. I look forward to hearing from you. So please take it away and tell us all about how we can get to net zero carbon footprint by 2030. Thank you. Excellent. I can figure out how to move this out of the way. Oh, I think we're good. So um, hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm glad to have you here. And I'm, I'm honored um, to have this opportunity. Um, thanks to Anne and Jen, Cope, um, Grant, yourself, um, Jocelyn, the Whaling Museum. Um, I'd also like to say a thank you to Tim Irwin from Ramble, who was our partner in helping to pull some of these slides together for us. Um, and I uh, want to give you all sort of a little bit of a brief primer in terms of why this is something that's important for us to be looking to do. And for some reason, I don't think I have control over moving the slides. Nicole, is that something that you have? No, it's there at the bottom. There we go. So um, initial journey for the university, uh, we set out in 2007 to really look at the university's carbon footprint and just how much carbon we were emitting. In order to do that, we had to go back a few years. We found a baseline and an average from 2003 to 2005. We at UMass Dartmouth are emitting about 29,459 metric tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere on an annual basis. And that's too much. Um, the President's Climate Commitment was created in 2007. We pledged to be a part of that. We wanted to reduce our emissions by 80% by the year 2050, um, with an interim goal of having a 40% reduction by the year 2020, you know, way in the future. Uh, well, guess what? That's now. Um, the best we achieved as a university in 2010 was about an 11% um, reduction. We did some fuel switching, got off of uh, number five fuel oil, got into natural gas. Um, that slipped down to about a 6% savings overall, um, despite all the conservation efforts that we were doing and lots of co-generation and um, you know, a $25 million upgrade project that we had done um, at the university. Um, but what we realized is that we needed to have a transformation. We can't get there by doing just incremental changes. We had to have a radical transformation. That really came from our students. Um, here's a shot of our students who were out um, protesting and um, asking the administration to sign on to a carbon neutrality pledge and that they wanted to see us do that by 2030. Um, the Sunrise Movement and the Green New Deal are some of the other societal factors that were helping to sort of influence um, the fact that um, this is something that's really, really important to our young people because they're going to be inheriting all of these problems that we're essentially creating. 
just a quick reminder that global carbon dioxide has been going up for a very long time. If you go back to the beginning of sort of the industrial revolution in the 1880s, that was really when you saw that starting to kick off. And it's because we're burning fossil fuels and those emit greenhouse gases. Um, just a reminder, Australia is on fire. The Arctic is on fire. The Amazon is still on fire. The western part of the United States is on fire. There are hurricanes, one right now that just went from being a tropical depression to being a category four storm that's gonna be hitting um, the Yucatan Peninsula and then into uh, Louisiana um, over the weekend. Um, that didn't happen at that ferocity before. Um, our ice sheets are collapsing. This is a lovely little glacier that just happened to break off of Greenland and is heading on its way out. Um, in 19, I'm sorry, in 2019, the Greenland ice sheet lost 197 billion tons of water into the Atlantic um, because of the temperatures and that it's so hot um, that it's just in, you know shedding itself. It's a little scary, it's a little frightening, and that's part of my intention is that I want us to be mindful of the fact that this is the reason why we have to act. So one of the things the university did as a part of our energy master plan is that we sat down with a very smart group. Um, Ramble is our partners um, in um, doing this. Um, they're a company uh, based out of Copenhagen, but they've got some US partners here as well. Um, and we got to take an assessment of sort of how it is that we create heat and utilize electricity. Um, so we went through a very, very deep dive looking specifically at pieces of technology and how all of those kinds of things are generating together. Um, they looked at our heating profile to look at, you know, when it is that we're producing heat, when it is that we're producing cooling, um, how much energy are those kinds of things using, um, and the number of hours in which we're producing those things. And um, what we've learned through that process is that in you, when you start to look at heat, um, most of us um, conventionally have looked at heat in terms of there's a base load of heat. I'm sorry, that's just heat. Like if you if you turn the heat on like one of these days, some of you say not until October 1st or November 1st, you know, we're not turning the heat on in the house. Um, it's just either on or off and then you set it to a temperature and it comes from your furnace. Um, what the, the new sort of thinking around this is that there's different kinds of load profiles. There's actually something called a base load, and that can be handled with one set of technology. Um, there's another sort of medium level that you would kind of use um, sort of during some of those like the more intense heating or cooling seasons. And then occasionally it gets really, really cold and we have to use sort of that peak load where maybe we could use um, some more of our um, harmful types of um, emitting things. Um, but we would only be using that for a very short period of time. So it's looking at, at a heating profile in a very different sort of way. Um, we went out and looked at sort of all kinds of different technologies um, in terms of how are, how are ways that we can cut our carbon. Um, and here's all the different methods that you could use um, potentially to do some of that stuff. Um, so again, we try to stay away from the fuel-based kinds of solutions because we knew that that was going to just continue to emit things. Um, some people were excited about the idea of, you know, getting sort of a bio oil involved. Um, but what you find is, you know, a 20% mix of bio oil means it's 80% um, regular fossil fuels with 20% fuels created from algae or some other biological source. It's still 80% petroleum based. Um, so again, that's not necessarily a really great option. There's lots of renewable fuel sorts of options that we sort of look at um, as a part of this whole process. Should we do a biomass burner? I'm going to do a bio oil burner. Um, so, so those are sorts of interesting things. Um, clearly there's renewables as a part of this in terms of either photovoltaics, wind turbines, solar thermal is another piece where we could just take the sun to heat water and then be able to circulate that. Um, a future development that was at least mentioned, but we're not quite there yet, is micro-nuclear. So a little bit of teeny little micro-nuclear reactor that we could have, not feasible at the moment. Um, and then the last category is really electrification. Um, so these are all the different potential sources of um, heat that we could be able to derive um, without having to burn a fossil fuel. So of those that we looked at, um, what we tried to look at, these are ones that we feel for our campus are going to be the most realistic ones. Um, and so again, it was a pretty in-depth process of going through and kicking the tires and you know comparing this versus that. And we went from whatever this number of lists you know, down to about 
16 down to 12 down to 5 and now down to what is going to be ultimately our most likely scenario. Um, this is a process for the university that's going to take about 10 to 12 years to fully transition into um, because it's going to be involved major infrastructure upgrades um, and none of those kinds of things happen quickly. Um, one of the interesting things as a part of this process, um, and I can talk a little bit more about this in a second, um, we looked at some interesting things like you can get heat from sewage as an example. So for instance, in New Bedford, we have our campus at SMAST and it happens to be located right next to where the main sewer line comes out of the city of New Bedford and goes to their waste processing plant. That actually represents an opportunity for us in the future if we ever wanted to tra transition those facilities off of a fossil fuel burning thing and into capturing waste heat from that line that comes through there. Um, seawater is another option. Um, Cornell is doing a really great um, project right now where they actually are getting thermal energy from the lake um, that they have, one of the finger lakes. Um, so again, SMAST has another one of those opportunities. The uh, pond that we have at the university, not large enough to sort of um, warrant being able to do that. Um, here's a process flow diagram, and it's a big diagram, but um, if you sort of follow it from kind of going from left to right, um, this is a uh, as we build out this program for ourselves, we've got it phased in sort of ones, twos, and threes in terms of which ones we need to go through first. But we're currently using natural gas and buying electricity. Um, what we're likely to do then is to switch out of that and go into um, using ground sourced heat pumps and, and geothermal um, as a way to both store as well as to recover some heat. Um, there is heat recovery chillers that they have. So um, what you may not know is that we both heat the university and cool the university at the same time. Think of like large computing centers um, or computer labs or just even some of our mechanical rooms have got um, highly technical equipment in them for um, acid neutralization tanks and those kinds of things. So we're chilling a heating room. Um, so that's um, one of the ways to sort of be able to borrow I need cold to go this way, I need heat to go that way. So we're gonna generate both of those by sharing with ourselves rather than just wasting all of that off to the atmosphere and having to generate all of those things. So heat recovery chillers are a really great thing to have at the heart of that. Um, there's other you know, electric chillers and some big tank storage that we would need for um, our thermal, both cold as well as hot. Um, and then lots of pumps to be able to move that water around through the, through the entire university. Um, so that gives you a sense of kind of the direction that that thing would be going in. Um, kind of excited about the idea of geothermal and us being able to put boreholes in. Um, this is one way for us to look at the fact that for the heating load at our campus, we would need about 25 acres to be able to sink that in. Now we're really fortunate because we have 350 acres of developed land at the university. We've got another 360 acres in forest. Um, I would prefer not to cut down a forest and they were going to put in boreholes, um, but we've got lots of green space. Paul Rudolph was a genius when it came to sort of designing this sort of strong green space that runs through the entire campus. Um, we may need to put them underneath a couple of parking lots, which would be slightly disruptive while we're doing it, but again, it's asphalt and we can, we can go back over that and that could be a part, a part of it. Um, it does require that we put in a new net zero um, energy plant and that would be cited um, most likely very near our existing plant because that's where all the utility lines kind of all run back to. So um, what does this have to do with sort of lessons learned from the university world and how that can get transferred to your own homes? Um, and I want to spend just a little bit of time on this. Um, you know, the first thing that you need to be aware of is that conservation is the most important. It's our first fuel that we should be going to. So um, if you have the opportunity to participate, the Mass Save program in Massachusetts allows for free, yes, I said that, F-R-E-E, -E, it does not cost you anything, home insulation. That they will come in, analyze how much you need, and then provide it for you because that's the best way to have to save creating those therms. We don't have to create as much if, we, if we're better insulated. It also helps in the summertime as well. So we're saving on both ends of these things. Um, so that's a great opportunity to do that. Um, we did that here at my house. Um, it was about $8,000 worth of work that was covered um, by this fund that exists. Um, now, mind you, Mass Save Fund is funded from a tax that's put onto our utility bills that we put into this centralized fund. And then this is a way for us to take that tax back and be the beneficiaries of it. 
Um, so it's your money, you might as well be able to take advantage of it and then not have to have as big an energy bill um, for yourselves. Second thing to think about, um, ductless mini splits, um, it's essentially a heat pump. Um, we had our air conditioning system at our house break, and so we had to replace the heart of that. And what we found is that that was going to be about a $30,000 job, or I could put in a ductless mini split system for about $15,000. And it provided us with heat, air conditioning, as well as dehumidification, all without burning any fossil fuels. So that's a really great technology that you can use at the home level. We use it sort of on the industrial steroid sized ones um, for the university. Um, there's also air source heat pumps that you can use for hot water heaters. We actually put one in here. Um, it goes in the basement. And again, the benefit of that is that we actually have a dehumidifier running in our basement year round, and I don't have to have a separate one of those. So I've got a super dry basement and we're getting um, sort of free dehumidification at the same time that we're generating our hot water, again, off of electricity, which that we get from our solar panels. Um, um, also, just um, you know, another exciting sort of opportunity. I know ground source heat pumps have been around for a long time at the residential level, but people don't necessarily believe that um, the technology is sort of ready to be used. And I'm telling you that it is at this point. Um, the BTES or those boreholes, thermal um, energy storage pieces, um, you can do that either on a new construction, which is easiest to sort of rip up your lawn and put some you know trenches out there or some, do some holes, or um, if that's something that you want to even do. Um, you know, once you have an established house, um, that can be modified as well. You just need to have a, a space that, you know, is large enough to be able to put those things in. Um, so those are things that are directly transferable in terms of things that we're learning to do at the university, as well as ways that that can get transferred out into your world as well. So um, that's sort of the formal sort of pitch that I wanted to give you a sense of kind of where this is going and, and some of the things that we've learned. Um, in my uh, fourth grade D.A.R.E. class, there was always the, the D.A.R.E. officer always ended his, um, his presentations with the questions, comments, criticisms, or snide remarks. So um, I open this back to you, the viewing public, and um, let me know what you'd like to know more about. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was great. Um, so everyone, my name is Nicole Danaher Garcia. I'm a recent UMass Dartmouth graduate and now a research assistant with a nonprofit. And I'll be taking care of all of your questions. If you highlight on your screen, you'll see the chat feature at the bottom. You can go ahead and click that and type any of your questions and I will read them out loud to Jamie and then he'll answer them for us. Um, we do have one from Grant. He would like to know how we get rid of the parking lots. How we get rid of parking lots? How we get rid of them to put things underneath them and then put the parking lot back. Oh, that's pretty easy. They drill some holes in it and they put the stuff, the, the boreholes go down and then um, they're, they're able to pipe the, the stuff over the side and then they just go back and repave it. So that some matter. of our parking lots need to be repaved anyway, so this is actually kind of a win-win for us. It takes some things off the deferred maintenance list and puts it onto the capital projects and then it just happens as a part of the energy piece. Very cool. Thank you. Anne would like to know, can you explain the bio oil boiler a bit more? Sure. Um, bio oil is an amazing um, sort of technology in that it's super simple and it's really approachable. Um, it looks like gasoline or, or fuel oil at this point. Um, it's just that it was sourced through um, a biological method. So whether that's an algae or like a vegetable fryer oil that's been converted into petroleum um, that can be burned. And um, it's uh, any burner that you have, you can do that in your own home. You can do this in, in larger sorts of things. You just need to have um, some modifications done to the actual burner um, that runs that boiler or furnace. Um, and you can use a different fuel for that. You know, there's some of them right now that burn either natural gas or um, either diesel or um, fuel oil. Um, it's a similar sort of a thing. Bio oil is another version of that fuel oil. Um, so it's just a question of some tweaking and some and adjustments that need to take place. So one of the potential solutions for the university um, is, again, we've got an uh, existing cogeneration plant on campus where we're using natural gas to make a steam and that spins a turbine and we generate electricity at the same time we're generating the steam. Um, we could switch off of natural gas and go over to a bio oil. Um, it's a little bit more expensive of a fuel to do that for, which is why it's kind of on the third tier for us that we want to use that only at that peak sort of time when we absolutely have to pay 
um, you know, pay a premium for that, um, those fewer, those fewest days as possible, um, rather than doing that sort of on an everyday basis. Great. Um, and then another, could you explain a bit more about the heat recovery chiller? Sure. Um, um, and again, I have to preface this by saying I am not an engineer, so I listen to engineers and try to help to sort of, you know, translate. Um, you know, think of it as you've got hot water coming in this way and cold water coming in this way, and then they pass through um, sort of like the, like the radiator in your car where the uh, air comes through and heat is expended from one to the other because there's a temperature differential. And so as you're piping this hot water loop or this cold water loop out to the campus, um, you have, have you know, it's, it goes out and then comes back into the plant. And then at the plant, it has either an excess amount of heat or cold, which it then transfers to the opposite system to then send back out. So it's a really super efficient way of being able to say, okay, we're gonna heat this water once, we're gonna cool this water once, and then after that time, we're just gonna keep transferring it back and forth between each other. Dave would like to know, what factors went into the decision to have a PV versus the wind turbine? So um, again, we're open to all um, you know, future technologies in terms of what is coming for ways to get our electricity. Um, in Massachusetts, we're really fortunate in that our grid is becoming greener on a daily basis. Um, if you look at the amount of um, solar farms that have been going up, the amount of wind farms that are coming up, the amount of ocean-based wind farms that we're going to be gaining, in the very near future, um, that that's really going to be greening our entire electric grid. Um, one potential would be for us to try to site some of those kind of behind the meter and be on our campus. Um, but again, trying to size the amount of that so that we're getting the right amount of wind and the right amount of sun for the load that we have. Um, right now, we can't send any of that electricity if there's extras back to the grid itself because of the agreement that we have with Eversource. Um, that's something that we maybe need to look at. Uh, battery storage may be another way to be able to sort of hang on to that so that when we have a peak time, we can use some of that. Again, it's extra windy, extra sunny. We'll use some of that either tomorrow when it's cloudy and not blowing or at night when maybe the sun isn't up. So, um, you know, that's something that needs to be a part of the solution um, for us. So kind of a, a two-part thing. We're, we're lucky to have a grid that's getting greener and we need to do some of that on our own campus behind the meter where we can. And on that note, Lee is wondering if the university is planning any solar arrays. Fun fact, most people don't know that we have 269 kilowatts of power um, of photovoltaic um, on top of five of our buildings um, on campus. So four of our residence halls and on top of the gymnasium. Um, and those have been installed um, since 2010. Um, so they've been cooking along and um, doing a really great job of um, giving us lots of energy. So this all looks like a pretty big project. Uh, so Eric is wondering how much it will cost and where the funding will come from. <laughs> a great question. Um, so this is um, one of the challenges that um, we've had. We've been partnering with um, members of the state. Um, the Leading by Example program um, helped us to do this study. Uh, we're partnering with the uh, Department of Capital Asset Management, um, who is sort of the main owner of most of the assets um, within the Commonwealth. Um, we're doing this study. There's actually three other universities that are doing this study right now, UMass Lowell, UMass Amherst, and Salem State. We're hoping that the four of us combined are going to sort of get a good sense of um, understanding how it is that you achieve this carbon neutrality. Um, and again, what could be borrowed from any of these approaches that can be utilized at other state facilities, um, because we're not the only people within the Commonwealth that go ahead and release carbon. Um, if you look at the top 20 emitters right now, four of them are UMass campuses. UMass Amherst is the largest within the state portfolio. Um, and you know, it, it'll be important for us to solve that in conjunction with our legislative partners, with our partners at DCAM. Um, and you know, there may be a possibility that we have to go out to donors um, within the Commonwealth to be able to say there's some campuses, um, small campuses that are doing this. You know, that if you can you know, approach a donor and say, gosh, you could get a market return of 5% on your money in the market, or you can get a 8% return by investing in us and helping us to do this new energy plan. 
um, and we'll, we'll be able to return that to you because these are just guaranteed to be able to um, get, get back some money. Um, so that may be another approach for us to look at. Um, that's a, it's a big question mark for us and we're gonna have to work together to, to solve that part. Um, this is the how, the next part is, you know, how do we actually get it funded and, and put in place? Thank you. And Kate Lovett is wondering if there are any grants available to public or private larger entities, for example, companies, businesses, or schools? Um, not that I'm aware of, but I trust this group and the brain trust that we have out there. So if there's anybody else out there who's aware of that, um, please let us know. I mean, as I had mentioned before, you know, we're working with the state and um, actively trying to be a part of um, the granting process that they have to look at, you know, innovative technologies and approaches and to be the, the test case. Um, the, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has been really, really awesome at, again, leading by example. That's one of the state programs. Um, and, you know, they want to be able to try new different things to be able to sort of get proof of concept. And so, um, you know, that's what we're hoping this plan is going to try to unleash for us is to be able to say, okay, let's, let's let us answer the question, how do you do this now, let's partner to go ahead and do it. So uh, we, we're taking all donations and uh, opportunities for grants out there. Um, and so just to clarify, Anne had asked if there was any indication that the state is supporting the efforts at UMass Dartmouth and you just did say that this state of Massachusetts is very involved in this? They've been at the table with us the entire time. Um, and again, we, we knew from the beginning that this isn't something that, you know, our campus alone was just going to be like, oh, hey, we've got, you know, a big piggy bank sitting here and we can just afford to do that ourselves. Um, Stanford University is a great example of a, a very wealthy institution you know, that was able to lead in this project that they were out there doing um, carbon neutrality, you know, five years ago. Um, they went with essentially the same sort of a system. Heart, the heart of it is heat recovery chillers. They've got lots of solar opportunities out there. They also don't have um, winters like we do. Um, so again, it was a little different sort of scale of things. Um, but again, it's, it's nice to be a part of a, a supportive higher education community who's trying to share that information and that knowledge. Um, Stanford's been great, Michigan State's been another. Um, Carleton College is uh, doing a lot with um, their own geothermal program um, that they've been really forthcoming with information as well for us. So you mentioned how cold our winters are. Mm -hmm. uh, Kimberly was wondering that considering the infrastructure of the campus buildings themselves, how will we combat the porosity of concrete buildings? I.e., is the draft that is constantly within the buildings, um, how will we contain more heat than we lose? So Paul Rudolph was a visionary architect. Um, we have one and a half million square feet of his architecture. Um, he also did not believe in or understand the true cost of heating that space. Of course, to be fair to him, in 1966, the price of oil was you know two dollars a barrel. So um, the cost um, issue was very different. Um, that's going to be a really big challenge for us, is how do we insulate a historic Paul Rudolph building um, that has lots of angles jutting out and single pane windows and fluted concrete that is not insulated. Um, and are we going to, at some point, have to make that sort of bigger question of, do we save some of the buildings or one of the buildings for its historic nature, but due to the fact that they are unable to go ahead and be weatherized that we're going to have to abandon them. Um, again, I, I'm not saying that that decision has been made, but it's, it's one of those questions on the table that we have to ask ourselves. Um, we like Rudolph. We, we are special in that our entire campus is built around that central core concept. Um, but just because it's hard to do doesn't mean that we walk away from that responsibility. I think that gives us a huge opportunity to be able to win and to be able to share that information with other brutalist architecture locations to say that it is possible to do that. Our library is a really good example of some wins that we've had, putting in glass curtain walls, being able to change out the windows, um, looking at some other features to highlight the, sun, um, the sunlight um, during the seasonal opportunities. So I think that there's some ways to be able to do that kind of a thing, but it is a big challenge. Daniel is wondering um, how the university is lowering its carbon output through 
the campus vehicles or lawnmowers or other things in addition to the actual infrastructure? So um, just this year, we secured um, a Prius Prime that our parking enforcement folks are gonna be using. Um, not that there's a lot of enforcing going on at the moment, but be that as it may. Um, so we've um, been slowly working towards electrifying our fleet. Um, the opportunities are increasing in terms of the volume of specialized vehicles. Um, again, we have a lot of tradespeople that need to carry lots of heavy duty stuff. And so how do we have robust vehicles that are gonna be able to sort of stand up to that kind of thing? Um, so we are actively working with um, the purchasing agents and the decision makers in each of those areas to be able to sort of look at and evaluate um, how things are gonna run. Um, literally five years ago, you know, I, I sat down with some of our um, operations folks and, and posed the idea of switching over our entire facilities fleet into electricity. And they looked at me like I had three heads and that's kind of normal in my world for people to react that way. Um, but now you see things like the Cybertruck and you see um, Revian and um, there's at least, you know, four different manufacturers who are coming out with fully electric trucks right now. Um, so I think that in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see a complete transition of our fleet over into those EVs. Um, so we're excited to be able to, to be launching that. We also um, are working with um, other um, agency is a, is a national organization um, that we've committed to buying another um, electric vehicle within this next fiscal year um, and hoping to see that increase as well. Um, so we're part of a, a larger sort of purchasing program um, on a national level. So trying to leverage some of those opportunities to help bring, bring prices down as well as to um, see that amount increase. Thank you. And Keith is wondering if the university takes into account student emissions in their carbon accounting, for example, commuti commuting and those types, types of activities. Yeah, so that's um, the scope three emissions um, that we have. Um, this plan does not address that. Uh, we're focusing on scope one and scope two in our efforts to become carbon neutral. Um, having said that, we fully want to work on the scope three and have been doing a lot of work around improving infrastructure at the university, um, putting in additional bike racks. We had a bike share project that we did a demonstration project on, um, having busing and increasing the busing routes and having all students be able to ride the bus for free, utilizing their UMass Pass, um, encouraging carpooling. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that we have been doing um, to be able to see that improve. Um, we've also been trying to talk with the regional transportation planners around making sure that um, we've got better access to the train stations that are going to be coming in and trying to look at that last mile solution. Um, and electric bicycles and electric assist bicycles um, are going to be a really great opportunity for us to look at um, solving that. Um, so hopefully that's something that we can be working with our partners at CERTA and in both Fall River and New Bedford um, to be able to help bring to those communities to help our students to be able to, and faculty and staff, to be able to move around on a much easier basis. So while maybe the train doesn't come exactly onto our campus, getting to the train isn't an obstacle. So a key part of that sort of mass transportation solution. Dave would like to know what the time frame is for breaking ground. Um, well, as soon as somebody writes that first check, um, so we um, so I'm giving you some of this information um, sort of pre-completion. This is our first sort of dry run with this. Um, we'll actually be finalizing all of these plans into a report that'll be coming out um, at the end of November. Um, and from there, it'll be sort of that bigger question is, you know, where do we go from here? Um, what I can tell you is that um, putting in the central loops of both the heating and the cooling loops, um, that's probably about a five to seven year process for us to be able to get that funded dig up the, the campus. Um, for those of you, Nicole, who maybe were with us when we had to do the last um, steam line project, um, that took us about five years to accomplish as well, um, where we had to dig up our steam lines and replace those. Um, if we're switching over to hot water, some of that might be able to go through the steam lines. Um, some of it may have to be a completely separate set of system. Um, so we're looking at that kind of five to seven years optimistically to be able to get the, the campus loops done. 
Um, and then stages two and three can sort of follow on the heels of that. Um, the boreholes are also a part of that stage one um, as well. Um, so again, we're talking about holes that are 300 to 500 feet deep, kind of depends on are we hitting through solid granite or are we just going through kind of hard scrabble remnants of glacial till. Um, and we don't know that until we start boring and trying that out. Um, so we'll see how many of those were we are required to have to dig into what depth um, once we get there. Um, Going back to our earlier conversation, Nancy is wondering where the bio oil fuel will come from, the bio oil. It's a great question. Um, I know that um, there's several different producers of this. I know um, UMass Amherst was talking with a vendor out of Ohio. Um, there's a whole tank of it available uh, of B100 in Providence. Um, and so there's local um, opportunities for that. Um, but it's a, it's a great question. Um, and we'll see, um, you know, how that plays out. Um, again, it, if we're, we're talking about that as being sort of that last phase three peak usage kind of a thing. So it's not like we need a huge volume of that to be running all of our campus heat. Um, so in that sort of build out of the scenarios, we're talking about that being that sort of just peak usage. Jim is uh, would like to know what the problem was with converting seawater to water and how that would be used. I think I need to know a little bit more about that question. Are we talking about changing seawater into water or are we using the heat from seawater to heat our buildings? The way that the question is written is converting seawater into water and then how it would be used, but... That 100% uh, lies outside of my expertise. Okay, but do you have an answer to the other? question that you thought it might have been? Yeah, so um, it's a fairly easy sort of a thing. Um, if you take, um, you know, th there is um, heat available within seawater. Um, and so that's something that we can, you know, bring that heat in, pull some of that out, and then return it back out into the ocean without majorly disrupting the ecosystem that's there. Um, and so that's um, something that is used um, in a lot of different locations. Um, um, yeah, so for the SMAX campus, Jim, thanks for clarifying. Yeah, um, yeah so um, there's a, we already have a water inlet um, for our seawater tanks. Um, and so either we could tap into that system or we could have another draw that potentially could come in um, for that. Um, you know, it's an idea, it's not something that's a part of our main plan right now. Um, it's something that we could look at in the future. Fred says that Dartmouth and Westport still have a few dairy farms left where anaerobic digesters can be utilized. Could UMass Dartmouth support this effort for local farms? That would be awesome. Um, I would love to see a bigger biodigester um, placed in. Um, Eversource is actually looking at trying to source more, um, how do they refer to it? Um, natural biogas. So rather than natural gas, it's biogas. Um, and again, I think that um, there are other centers within Massachusetts um, where they're doing this sort of on a, on a larger scale. Um, I would love to see one come to southeastern Massachusetts. Um, so again, I think that that's another statewide conversation that we need to have in terms of what kind of grants would be available that we can bring to our area to be able to locate that here. Um, landfill gas is one source of that, certainly anaerobic digestion um, coming from animal waste as well as from food waste. Um, are great opportunities to be able to um, to pull off um, a gas that we can bring to the to the university. Um, university of New Hampshire was looking at doing a, a project with that. Ryan would like to know if you have a dream technology that you would like to see at UMass Dartmouth. If you had unlimited funding and resources, if, even if it's a technology that isn't commercially available. Nuclear fusion. You know, it's not this fission stuff. It doesn't have a byproduct at the end of it. It's, you know, it's 10 times the amount of power in a smaller contained location. Um, and I believe our friends at Raytheon were promising five years ago that that was five years away. So I think we may need to take a, a ride up the street and uh, check in on the sort of progress of that. Um, it's kind of like small nuclear fission, right? It, it's your micro fission. Um, you know, I think it's a great idea and a great possibility if done correctly. Um, in a non-dangerous manner. 
Um, it's funny because I think one of the things we, we talk about sometimes is, is magic, right? You know, there's some parts of the equation in math that they do this occasionally. Grant, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you know, it's like we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and then something magic happens here, and then this other thing goes on. Um, and so, you know, th th we're leaving room for the fact that technology is always improving and that um, science is always moving us forward. Um, and so we can't always rely on magic, but we know that things are evolving with technology. There's an old joke in the uh, nuclear fusion community that uh, fusion is the power of the future. It's 30 years away and it's always 30 years away. <laughs> I, I, I worry a little bit about that. There's a lot of progress being made, but it's still a long way away from viability. And I, I do really worry about the magical thinking of, oh, if we get fusion, then that will solve our problems. So we don't need to do anything today. Oh, no, no. I, I think we need to do things today. Right. And I think one of the interesting things in working with Ramble is that you know they came in and, and sort of sat us down at the beginning and said, all right, listen, what you thought five years ago would not work is working currently. And so you can't discount some of those technologies. And in the same respect, it's hard for us to say, you know, if we're going to create in five to seven years this heating and cooling loop, who's to say that what the technology is going to be doing in five to seven years? And so that's why they're leaving some sort of question marks out there. But we know we need to get heat from someplace. Okay, here's what we know right now, but in the future that may change. We're going to have to relook at that in three to five years to get a sense of how the market has moved and changed and technology has evolved. On a kind of related note, Kimberly is wondering if UMass Dartmouth is tapping into the student body to foster innovative ideas, for example, from the civil engineers and bio majors creating a positive biofeedback energy circuit? So that's the next piece of this for us to crack into. Um, as of right now, this has been sort of at a, a staff level um, working with our consultants. Um, but it's something that we need to do a better job of once we sort of know these things to be able to take that then into the classroom and sort of say, okay, great, what is the next level for this to be at? Um, UMass Amherst is spending a, a little bit more time doing that on a slower basis. And so they're a little bit more embedded with their campus community in terms of their feedback loops. Um, it also means that their process is taking longer um, than ours is. So um, again, as they, they say sometimes that if you, if you want to go fast, go with a small group. If you're going to go long, you need to you know, go with a bigger group. Um, we're going a little faster, they're going a little longer. Um, but that's one of the great things about working in the system, not only within UMass, but also within the Commonwealth, is that we're all sharing those experiences. Um, so we're going to get a much more robust sort of answer in terms of um, how we recommend other campuses go about doing these things. Um, and I have a kind of related question. Yeah. One of the bio professors was working with the NOMO plots, and I was yes. wondering if you've learned anything from those or if anything has come of that project that was started just fairly recently. So Jamie's evil plan for landscaping. Um, so one of the benefits that Paul Rudolph had given us, right, was this beautiful green space that runs from the amphitheater down across Ring Road and all the way down to the pond. Um, at some point, the university made the decision to stop mowing one of those areas and it turned completely wild and has grown up into this big tree area so that you can't actually see the pond any longer. So that is one of our areas that we've targeted to become a no mow space, but we have to restore it back to its original sort of state. Um, if you may remember, may remember the first part of my slide had a picture of myself with a goat. We actually had goatscaping in this summer. We had uh, 15 goats on campus that were helping to sort of attack some of the invasive species in that specific area to try to help see which um, things they like to eat. Um, are they going to be able to, in a three-year cycle, eat enough of that down? Or are we going to have to maybe work with the, um, the state wildlife and fisheries folks to do maybe a controlled burn of the space to be able to take it all the way back down to starting place again so that we can restore a prairie field? And if you remember back to the map, you will see that that's one of the spaces where we were looking at a borehole field. So if we can clear cut all of those trees and other things on it, put in the geothermal wells there, then it's never going to have trees growing back up on top of it. It can be mowed once a year, and it can be you know sort of this other beautiful landscape. And it goes completely with the low mow um, 
philosophy that the biologists have been talking about, which is how do we define beauty differently? Um, most people on our campus historically from a landscaping perspective has said, we like it to look like a golf course. Um, and what we realize is that there's so many other benefits that we've found out from our biologists who have said, well, actually, when you only mow it once a year, what you find is that the soil has more moisture content in it, the heat level is lower, that there's more animals that flourish in the area, there's more of the good insects that don't like to bite you, there are fewer of the bad insects that do like to bite you, and there's all kinds of surprise species that will pop up like orchids that were popping up in the middle of a field. I have no idea how an orchid seed got out there, but we had one. Um, so just one of those happy surprises um, that exists. It also allows us to be more intentional about doing things like supporting pollinators. Um, and making sure that we've got bees, butterflies, and, and hummingbirds that are being supported um, through, again, a 25-acre swath of the university um, where we can still have cross-country events and we can still play disc golf and we can still have our energy being reaped from that area, but also having it look beautiful in a different way than we have some of the other spaces. So thanks for the question. Ayan is wondering, in your opinion, how close are we to a green campus playing a major role in a student's decision on which college or university to attend? And is that considered a competitive goal for UMass Dartmouth? Funny you should ask that. Um, UMass Dartmouth has been recognized by the Princeton um, Guide to Green Schools eight years running as being one of the 359 greenest schools in the country. Um, their publication points out to the fact that 78% of students make a decision on whether or not they want to go to a campus um, based on its sustainable values. Um, so this is a huge factor in this coming generation's decision making process. Um, and the reality is our campus has been doing this for a long time, that we're really well versed in doing it. We're doing it in energy, we're doing it in food, we're doing it in our landscaping. Um, and we're, we're seeing that play out in the living classroom philosophy that we have where our students are out helping to you know, create signage on our trail system. They're creating stories that are pulled from historians and from biologists that help educate people about the history of the flora, the fauna within our own forested area. Um, so we've been doing this for a long time. Great, thank you. Brian is wondering, how you make big advancements for protecting the environment when climate change has become so politicized? Well, I think we're fortunate in that we live where we do, um, that people in the Northeast recognize that climate change is a problem, um, that we trust scientists, we trust the scientific process, um, we trust our own eyes and um, understand rising waters and the acidification of the ocean and the changing nature of our planet, um, of our own local weather, how that's being affected. You know, we know from the National Climate Assessment that the Northeast is going to get hotter and it's going to get more frequent short bursts of storms. So we're going to see the hurricane that comes in and dumps a whole bunch of water on it and then we're going to have a drought for a really long time. Um, and that's going to happen with a nor'easter in the wintertime where we're going to get deluged with, you know, three feet of snow and then we'll have nothing else for two months. I mean, how many winters have we now had that there's been little to no snow? And it's just a question of time before we're going to get hit with the monster storm, but then maybe we're not going to have anything. And so that's going to become the norm as opposed to every year we go sledding, right kids? Well, maybe that's not going to be our reality. Um, so I think people locally understand um, some of those kinds of um, issues because they see them out their front doors. Um, and I think that they also are smart enough to believe in the scientific process. Thank you. Dave says that it looks like for the most part, this, your plan is using well-established technology. Are there any unique regulatory hurdles involved in putting it all together? There really shouldn't be. Um, again, this is some um, pretty well established stuff. Um, one unique opportunity that we had was to look at something called pit thermal. Um, and this is being done pretty extensively over in Europe, um, that rather than having a tank above ground where you sort of hold either hot water or cold water in it, the pit thermal would actually mean where we dig a pit underground and then stick our water there and it would be sort of protected by earth. Um, that's far more intrusive 
in terms of what happens and like what was there before or what kinds of things might there be problems with and it would be that might have been one of the first projects done in the United States at scale of a pit thermal and so we looked at that and said well you know we could be first but you know do you want to be first um, when there's other sorts of solutions that are tried and true and um, are less um, controversial um, in terms of being able to get done. And so there wasn't enough of a sort of delta T in terms of the value to the project of going with the pit to warrant being the first, you know, out of the box to do that. Thank you. Um, and we're coming up on our, our final questions. If anyone has anything else they'd like to ask, just a reminder that you can use the chat function. Um, but Anne was wondering if battery storage is feasible yet for all of the Not energy. only is it feasible, but we're using it. Um, the university already has a 500 kilowatt um, battery that we utilize um, as a way to help shave off peak charges. So um, what in the commercial market for electricity, um, the price of electricity changes based on sort of the demand. And during a really, really hot day in the summertime, getting more electricity, that, that extra fractional little bit of electricity has to come from like turning on a gas-fired power plant. Um, and so that's the most expensive electricity. What it allows us to do with our battery is to say, well, we're not going to have to buy that from the grid. We're actually going to use our battery storage to use electricity during that time period. And we can reduce the amount of demand that we have and those sort of highest expensive charges. Um, so we're already using that. Um, we actually use that kind of on a monthly basis because there's lots of programs that the um, utilities are doing and the grid is doing to be able to try to um, not have to um, fire up some of those plants. Um, that when you look at the amount of alternative energy that's coming in, the amount of nuclear that's running kind of on a base load kind of a situation, how do we make sure that we're trying to keep it as flat as we can and not have to have those gas peaking plants come online. Um, and if we can avoid those kinds of things, that's better for sort of everybody's life. Um, so battery storage is, is a great way to be able to do that. Very cool. Gail Davidson is wondering if wave generated energy will be coming soon. We're in an optimal area for that. It's a great question. Um, UMass Dartmouth has actually been pioneering um, having a in the water platform um, to be able to do research around that issue. Um, so again, we don't have the technology that we're testing. What we're doing is we're working with other innovative companies to say, here's the in water platform that you can come and hook your stuff up to so that you can test it out and try it out and see how feasible it is. Um, it's been something that's been um, being developed worldwide. Um, but having in-water facilities is a fairly rare thing. Um, you know, again, I think, Grant, that's another one of those technologies that's, you know, been talked about for a really long time. And, you know, it, the, I think some of the progress has been slow. Um, but you're talking about some pretty extreme kinds of pressures. Yeah, that, I think the big thing is it's an extreme environment. You know, ocean waves are constant and there's a lot of energy there, which is why it's really attractive but it also means that the equipment takes a lot of hit. I will say that we have a couple of researchers on uh, civil engineering. Uh, Dan McDonald is doing some research into wave energy extraction. So it, it's an exciting area of research right now. It's just how applicable it is and what we can do with it. Cool. And I, this looks like our last question, unless something comes in as we're talking. But Laura is wondering if you could give us an overview of how far the university has has to go to achieve zero net neutrality. So um, again, here's the here's the cards on the table thing, right? You know, we pledged in 2007 that we were going to drop our emissions by 80%. Um, we are currently at about 6%. Um, and so that's a, a far cry from the 40% that we were supposed to be at at this time in history. Um, it also gives you a pretty good idea of if you're going to go from a 6% to a 100% cut, just how big of a swath that's going to cut. Um, again, that's part of why I talked about this being transformational. You know, we couldn't just do this by insulating some pipes and, you know, maybe, you know, turning the thermostat down a little bit or, 
you know, cleaning up the cracks in the windows and making sure that no air was leaking out of it. I mean, this really is a transformational change. Um, and again, that's, I think, one of the things that we're finding as a, as a community as a whole is that when it comes to trying to get to that net zero um, piece, um, there's lots of challenges in getting there. Um, and it's big infrastructure kinds of things that are going to help us to do that. Now, having said that, um, again, in a perfect world, um, you know, we're going to try to do as best we can to get all of those different technologies using fossil fuels out. Um, we have like odd things, like there's a, a trailer that we have for the health services um, on campus, and they're actually heating it with propane right now. It's a small facility, but we're burning propane. Um, you know, could we find an alternate solution for that? Is the trailer going to be, you know, out of date and obsolete in 10 years, so we don't have to worry about that? Or do we have to either buy an offset for that or recognize that the university's 350 acres worth of forest actually provides us with a carbon sink? So we actually get some credit back on our accounting system because we have that forest. Um, so that's one of the benefits that we have um, that our forest provides for us is because they're soaking up oxygen and you know, they're soaking up carbon dioxide and giving out oxygen. There we go. So yeah, that's, that's um, another reality that we have to do. Um, a friend of mine that was working at uh, UC um, out in the desert, um, Merced, and um, they're one of the early um, carbon zero campuses. And you know, they did all kinds of innovative things and they got themselves down to a 78% cut and then they bought offsets for the rest of it. So they pay every year to a agency who then does really good projects like plants trees in the Amazon or plants trees across Africa um, as a way to be able to make up for the fact that they can't get rid of all of their emissions so they're paying somebody else to offset that and make you know um, the, to make that happen someplace else better so our goal is to do 100 percent of it here um, and I think that the, this technology is showing us this plan is showing us that it's entirely achievable thank you and we did get a couple more questions. So Timothy would like to know if this is unique to UMass Dartmouth. You did mention other schools, but are the other UMass campuses also moving towards this technology? So the whole energy master planning um, process or carbon mitigation or carbon reduction planning is something that lots of campuses are doing. Um, we're jointly um, at the same time, I should say, moving with UMass Amherst and UMass Lowell who are doing this along with Salem State. So in Massachusetts, those four campuses are sort of jointly, we meet on a monthly basis, you know, kind of sharing what we're learning, how things are going, you know, how do we, you know, what questions to be asking, um, you know, how much do you want to engage an additional community. Um, so we're, we're sharing that information internally um, with the hopes that, again, we're part of the state system and how can we transfer that information to the Department of Corrections or the courts or to the Department of Conservation. Um, because there's you know lots of opportunities to share that knowledge and that information and the approach. Um, so we are not alone in doing this, um, but I wouldn't say that 100% of schools are doing this. I think it's really a small minority. Um, but I think that's part of what makes us special and makes us different is that this is one of the values that we as a commonwealth have. It's something that we as a campus community have and have had for a very long time. Anne Brohom would like to know what efforts UMass Dartmouth is putting into sharing this with local companies. Well, for all of you on the broadcast today, that's a start. Um, you know, again, one of the, um, we need to get sort of our ducks in a row first of, of you know, what does the report say and how does that sort of play itself out? Um, but we've been active within the community trying to, to share that information out to either local government agencies or to local businesses. Um, I had to have my contact information up earlier that if there's somebody that's interested in helping um, in, in learning more about this, um, that is definitely a part of our philosophy is how do we um, share that information to be able to leverage what we've learned at the university to make sure that we can get that out into other places. Um, because again, as much of an impact that we can make. And again, we've got 29,000 metric tons of carbon that we're trying to account for. Um, by sharing that information, we can leverage that to even be greater um, with others. And so that, that technology transfer and that philosophical transfer is really something that's important. So um, by all means, contact me um, and I'd be happy to try to share more. 
Great. Well, thank you very much. That was our final question. Um, and it has been an hour, so I think it's all right to wrap up. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was a very informative, excellent talk. We're virtually clapping for you um, and cheersing you. And just to keep in mind for everyone else, our next cafe will be on Tuesday, November 10th, another virtual cafe. Our guest will be Dr. Jonathan Curtis from Brown University. Dr. Curtis is the director of the Lifespan Center for International Health Research. And he's a prominent malaria researcher who will be discussing a promising new strategy for combating malaria. Thank you everyone again for joining us today. And thank you, Jamie, especially. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you all taking some time out of your night to join us. Great, Great night. Thank you. Bye-bye.